I was just wondering how many of you have been to a very dark sky and seen it filled with stars? And that's, wow, a lot of you have. And how many of you have got to see the northern lights? I think sometimes they even come, have you ever seen it from the city though, right from here? Yeah, in Boston, you know, we're just that much further south that we, we don't see it there. Um, so we get jealous of you guys and, and the people further north who do see it. It turns out that even since the time of the Greek philosophers, people have wondered what is out there. And people speculated that the stars were suns and that they were planets out there just like here. And a few hundred years ago, um, there's a picture of Rome. And once I went there and it was like pouring with rain and super dark and I was in like a cafe with a friend. And right outside of our cafe was a statue of a very sullen person looking down in this big cloak. And it was Leonardo Bruno who had been burned at the stake for his philosophy. Part of it was that he believed in other planets orbiting other stars. And at the time, we're only supposed to believe that our Earth is the center of the universe. So how can there be other planets with life? That makes absolutely no sense at all. And last summer, I was reading a book um, called The Blue Tattoo. I don't know if any of you have heard about that. It's a really interesting book about this family in the 1850s who left the Midwest. And they were heading out to, it really wasn't that long ago if you think about it. They were heading out by land and like by caravan, basically, out to California. And when they were in the south, the desert south, they encountered a native tribe who, according to this book, like massacred the family but kept two of them. And it's a really good book because it's, um, like today, there's some memoirs that are sensationalized. <laughs> and this, when she, um, this young woman actually lived with the native tribe for quite some time, but eventually she was so-called rescued. But the book is a bit mysterious because it's not clear if she really wanted to be rescued you know, by the white people. And so her um, brother is still alive, he made it out and together they write this memoir. In the book, part of it's recounting her dialogue you know, throughout her journey with the native people. And one of them, she's telling them that there's this place called Washington DC and there are like, these buildings and all these people. And then she starts to switch topics and talks about her school. Well, in school we're taught that stars are suns and that there's humans around them. Because at the time before her family had left, a French astronomer Bessel had figured out how to measure distances to stars and they realize for sure that they are sons. And so just the fact that in this book, this young woman who's been recounting her story and her dialogue, it's just like an aside. It's like you almost wouldn't even notice it. But just for a long time, people have really wondered what is out there and who might be out there. And so today, for the first time, we're actually able to make strides towards that and to study stars out there. And so I'm gonna just give you a little bit of a kind of story about where we're at now and what we're trying to do in exoplanets and how we're trying to kind of put some facts behind these ancient questions. What is out there? What kind of planets are there? Is there life? And I'm starting with this. Um, I'm not sure how many of you will just come and enjoy the talk and how many of you are interested in pursuing this further, but I have a couple of things. This uh, little animation comes from a uh, program you can download. It zooms in and it's showing you a real map of the sky. All the white points are stars. The highlighted ones actually are stars with known planets. It's zooming into our Earth. You can see our planetary system. Um, it shows you planets and even some space telescopes are orbiting our sun. Now you can go to the software and you can go to any place on Earth. Here it goes to, the, uh, to California where this was made. And it can show you the night sky on any night. Here's some constellations. There actually is a very special patch of the sky. Does anyone know what that is? A, the Kepler Space Telescope focused on one patch of the sky for many years. So all of these highlighted stars are stars with known planets. Now, if you know any exoplanets, you can type in the name. And this one, they're typing in Kepler-186. And the software will take you to that, planet, that star system and show you what kind of planets are there. In this case, it's showing you orbits of, wow, there are five planets orbiting a star called Kepler-186. And you can go on this control panel and click on this so-called habitable zone, the zone around the star for planets with thin atmospheres that would be not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. And you can click on the planet and go further. And this is where you have to read the fine print, hypothetical visualization of planet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I had to talk really fast there because this animation was really fast and I, I didn't know how to slow it down, <laughs> but there you go. So you can take this uh, software, it's called Eyes on Exoplanets. You can download this later. I just wanted you to get a sense though that there are just thousands and thousands of stars with planets. And actually on any clear night, if we weren't in Chicago, but if you go out to the dark sky and look up, like some of those stars have planets actually. And probably they all do, but some of them for sure have planets. 
and we call those planets orbiting stars other than the sun exoplanets. Now, remember I showed you the Kepler-186 and it had the planets orbiting it? That was a real schematic of their orbits. But it turns out we don't know much about planets yet beyond their orbits and something about their masses and sizes. So for now, uh, we actually like to speculate about them. And I'm gonna show you a series of travel posters by NASA. <laughs> this one says Kepler-186F, that's the one that we were showing you in the Goldilocks zone, where the grass is always redder on the other side. <laughs> Now, Kepler-186, you couldn't tell from the animation, but it's a small red star. And the thought is that perhaps if life on that planet figured out how to harness sunlight, like our plants do, maybe they would have pigments at different colors, and so they won't look green, but the plants will look red. Here we have another one that says, HD, experience the gravity of HD 40307G, a super-Earth. And there are planets out there where we know the mass and size, and we know their surface gravity. And this planet has a surface gravity about one and a half times that of Earth. If we went there, we would have trouble walking. We would feel just crushed. If we like, tried to throw a basketball, it wouldn't, it wouldn't go far very easily. And in this case, they're just showing you this cartoon diagram of someone who's parachuting on this planet with higher gravity. Kepler-16b, it says relax on Kepler-16b, the land of two suns, where your shadow always has company. <laughs> And in this case, it is a planet, Kepler-16b, and there's a dozen that we know of like it, that orbit two suns. So the planet is actually orbiting two suns. And uh, it's amazing that really there's so many planets out there and they're just so incredibly diverse. With this particular one, we like to say that science fiction got some things right. <laughs> so what is an exoplanet? It's a planet that orbits stars other than the sun. Thousands of exoplanets are known to exist and we expect that nearly every star has a planetary system. So what I'm gonna walk you through today at this kind of high level, it's a series of questions I get asked most often. And these are asked by like my friends and by colleagues and by people I don't know or children, like literally every person Alexis. And you can like read through these and think about which might be the most popular question and I'll let you know when I get to it. So I said, what is an exoplanet? And now I'm going to go to the next question I get asked most often, which is when and how we will, will we find another Earth? So here I'm gonna run some numbers by you. This is an Apollo image of Earth and the sun is there, not exactly to scale, but I wanted to convey to you that our Earth, um, although it may feel big to us, you know, if you ever travel or you drive um, across the country, it feels huge, but our Earth is actually very tiny. And compared to our sun, it's so small and so low mass and so less bright that it makes the problem of finding planets incredibly challenging. And I do want to run some numbers by you. So our Earth, it turns out, is about 100 times smaller than our sun. In um, area, it's about 10,000, the square of that, 10,000 times smaller than our, our sun in, in area. But our Earth is 100,000 time, times less massive. And if you can grapple with numbers like in the billions, our Earth is 10 billion times fainter than our sun in reflected light. So if I were to ask you, um, you know, you're gonna go out and find planets, you know, which technique would you wanna use? One that requires you to do on the order of 100 times of a measurement? Um, something that is like 100,000 times measurement. And by measurement in this way, I mean decimal places. If you want to find a planet in the glare of its host star or in a technique that finds it within a, near its host star, think about 100 times or 10,000 times. You know, like if, I, if you were gonna go out and build some furniture you have a ruler and you're gonna measure the room and figure out what kind of pieces you need and how to put it together. Like I'm guessing that you're not measuring things to two decimal places or four decimal places, or in the case of 10 billion, you would be measuring something to 10, 10 decimal places. So if I were to ask you which technique would you choose, um, at least I'm hoping you would choose the one that was in size. Our Earth is 100 times smaller. And actually the way we find planets today, although we have many ways to find them, the easiest way is with related to size because of the comparison of planet to star, it's the smallest ratio. And how we find planets is by a technique called the transit technique. I want you to uh, look at the cartoon on the top. We don't see any stars resolved that way other than our sun. But can you see the planet going in front of the star? Yeah, it's about the size of Earth compared to the size of our sun. But what we do as astronomers is on the bottom actually, that graph, we can measure the brightness of a star like taking an image of it every 30 seconds or every few minutes and do that over and over and over again. 
And some stars, believe it or not, there's a planet lined up just so, so the planet goes in front of the star, as seen from here, from Earth. And it drops in that tiny amount of brightness, and this transit event will last for a few hours, and uh, when the planet finishes transiting, the star goes back to its original brightness. And then one orbit later, it repeats. It happens over and over again. And astronomers all over the world study this. There are professors here at the University of Chicago that work on it. And even more interesting is if you're an undergraduate and you are um, taking an astronomy class, this is like almost standard part of the curriculum at many universities across the country to use a telescope, an observatory at the university, and to look at a star that has a known transiting planet and to measure this light curve, and then to extract the size of the planet. So this is something that may seem like bizarre out there, but it is a very standard way to find planets. Now initially, when people first started working on this, you'd see a drop in brightness like this, but it could be any number, one of many things. It could be like an error in the telescope, maybe the telescope just heated up suddenly, or um, the battery did something funky, or there's another star that's a binary star. And initially, they were literally would take people 10,000 hours to go from a plot like that to knowing that there was a planet there. So there's tons of work behind what, what, I, what I just said, but I wanted you to know something about planets. And here is a real planetary system. This one is showing you seven planets, seven transiting planets. And if you look at the bottom, it's just time and days, but for our purposes, it's on the order of hours along the bottom axis and on that y-axis. And by the way, I don't have too many plots. I just wanted you to see the astronomer's view of a planetary system. <laughs> it's just this plot. And you can see in the y-axis, it's just showing you the drop of brightness. And you can see that the planets, all these transits, they're different sizes and different depths. It's telling us about the orbit and the size of the planet relative to the size of the star. And I wanted to show you one more plot, actually, where these planets came from. And it's going to be, um, people from the ground discovered this particular system. It's called TRAPPIST-1. And here's a plot showing you 20 days of observations. And what you're seeing here is it's a space telescope that's been measuring a star for literally 21 days in a row. It's called the Spitzer Space Telescope. And it was measuring the brightness of the star like every few minutes. And the data ended up getting downlinked to Earth. And there's some gaps there when the telescope wasn't taking data. But can you see the transits here? There are all these little drops, actually. And it's just this incredible thing that, that if you take the data and kind of cut it up and piece it together and put all the light transits together, you come up with the, the transit curve. Well, I just wanted you to have a little bit of a technical insight into what astronomers do, and they look at data and make models and fit it to data and extract things. And now I'll tell you about this planetary system. This particular system is one of our most like, outstanding favorite systems of all time so far. It's called TRAPPIST-1. And TRAPPIST-1 is a very uh, odd star, actually. It is a very, very small star. It's shown here in a schematic in orange, and our sun would be this big down here. This star is so small, <coughs> so cold, so dim. If it were any smaller and colder, it wouldn't be a star. It wouldn't be able to fuse hydrogen and burn energy on the inside. Now, what you see here is it's just a little bit bigger than Jupiter, actually. But a group of astronomers purposely went after this star this type of star. They put 20 stars on their list, and they did it because it's much easier to find planets transiting small stars than it is to find a planet transiting a big star. And so in this way, they found the mo one of the most bizarre systems ever. And it's showing you the planets all in a row there. Uh, we don't know what they are. They're all just kind of white showing you that. Now, this star is called TRAPPIST-1. Actually, you know what its real name is? Um, let's see if I have it here. At the bottom there, I put it. It's 2 mass J2306292825022285. That's a mouthful. So the people that studied this, they called their survey TRAPPIST. And therefore, they were allowed to name this planet, kind of unofficially, TRAPPIST-1. The system, rather, TRAPPIST-1. And the planets just get named in order of discovery. So on these particular stars, um, I just wanted you to know that in our search for other Earth, we're doing what we call, and it's not just me. Actually, I'm not even really doing this myself, but <laughs> the community is kind of the race to the bottom. What are the smallest stars out there with planets? that are the easiest things we can detect. And I wanted you just to get a flavor that all stars come in different sizes and shapes. And here you can see, um, you can see our sun. I put it here, it's just a cartoon diagram. Here's a small star. Here's a big star, really big, red giant. Here's another big star. But see this dot? Um, 
it's the same size, but I put it there because when I look at it, it sure looks a lot bigger to me when it's in front of that small, small star. So what I wanted to do was to let you know that the way we're going to find another Earth is to go after the smallest stars and use the easiest technique, the transit technique. And that's how we're going to find another Earth. Right. Right. So what I wanted to do now for a moment was um, take you on a virtual trip to a planet orbiting a very small star. Okay. So in this case, um, it could be that the planet is very, the star, your sun on this other planet, would be very big in the sky. Because in order for the planet to be like life supporting or have the right temperature for life, for a small star, the planet has to be very close to the star because the small stars have very low energy output. The analogy would be, it's like having a campfire that's burning just a tiny amount. You know, you have to walk up really close to that fire to feel any warmth. So the planets are so close to the star that they feel, um, they're so close to the star, the star might be very big in the sky. In this case, the artist has given an artist license to make the sky red and showing you some other planets in the same system. But another thing about being so close to the star is that tides, tidal interaction, just like our moon and our earth have tides, over time puts the planet in a very special configuration. Just like our moon shows the same face to earth at all times, our moon, you know, for every time our moon rotates, it orbits once. And the planet would be doing the same thing. So one day would actually equal one year. Every time the planet orbits, it rotates one time. And it shows the same face to the star at all times. What this means if we're at the planet visiting is that the star, the sun, would be in the same place of the sky at all times. So would you choose to visit where it's always daylight? Yes, down here. But if you're a true amateur astronomer, you'd probably go to where it's always night. Maybe you'll go to where the sun is always setting. Now, if you're on this planet, um, you're... A year, one year, these are very close to the star, and by Kepler's law, closer to the star a planet is, the faster it orbits. So one year, the time to go around the star would be about 10 days. So if you were a kid, I don't see any kids here, but for a child, you know, you'd have your birthday every 10 days. <laughs> We'd all be really old by now. Now, visiting this planet, on the other hand, might not be a very good idea. Because these small stars, they give off a lot of flares. Um, energy and particles that would, you know, if you flip out your phone, it would literally destroy your phone, short circuit the electronics and destroy parts of it. It might, I don't know what kind of sunscreen you'd have to prevent like genetic mutations from these high energy particles. And in fact, this one star, TRAPPIST-1, the Kepler Space Telescope observed a field of stars recently for 80 days and TRAPPIST-1 happened to be in that field. And what they saw was that TRAPPIST-1 flared 40 times, four zero times in those 80 days. And one of the flares, the people who worked on this estimated, was that it was, had as much energy as the Carrington event. Now, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of the Carrington event. In 1850, a remarkable thing happened on our Earth that we haven't seen since. And astronomers had been studying the sun, trying to understand sunspots and the magnetic field. And they saw like a little brightening, Carrington in the UK, a little white brightening. And like a couple days later, our Earth literally lit up. People could see, if you hadn't seen northern lights, you would see them, almost down to the equator. And they were so bright around here that you would actually uh, be able to read a newspaper by them in the middle of the night. And it turned out that people using the telegraph, some of them, they burned their fingers. The things caught on fire. And what had happened was part of our sun, uh, a big a mass ejection that had its own little magnetic field, came through space hurtling towards Earth. And it got trapped in our magnetic field and induced a current. Essentially, it like charged our whole planet. And that wouldn't be good today, by the way. We are really worried that if that happens, our power grid is, is going to be fried. I mean, it sounds really funny here in a talk, but it's actually a really serious problem. And some of you might remember 1989. This was like in Canada, though, uh, where I'm from. I'm from Canada. They had actually a mini one of these. It just hit like, and they now have the equivalent of circuit breakers on, on their power grid, but we don't have that here in America. So imagine you're on this planet now. And they have just said, wow, like once every 80 days, this planet or the star is giving off energy in a big bubble, like equivalent to the Carrington event. Like that doesn't sound like a very good place for us to visit. So uh, it's a kind of crazy world out there. And I'm not really sure what we're going to find on these planets orbiting these small stars. But the bottom line is that's how we're doing it. I call this uh, the fast track. We're going to find another Earth by searching small stars for Earth cousins instead of Earth twins. And we, meaning like Astronomers all around the world with all the telescopes we have are searching for these small planets transiting small stars. 
I'll come back to Earth and the Earth later. But I just wanted you to have that out there, that we don't know what they are. They're, they're, we don't know what they're like, but we have some already. We have the Trappist planets and several others, actually, that appear to be in their so-called Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. And so we're eager to look at them with more sophisticated telescopes and find out what's going on. Okay, so well, here are the list of questions still. And believe it or not, the question I get asked most often is, can we go there? Because, you know, then it falls onto the next one. If we can't, why are we bothering to look? So let's just talk about this for a moment. And I do have an um, image of our sun, a real image. And let's just talk about scale for a moment. Um, I chose this one purposely because it has a little sunspot, almost what the size of Earth would be. Okay, so our sun is really big. Remember, we went over that. Our Earth is really small. Now the question for you is, where would Earth be physically? If that's the size of our sun, raise your hand just, you know, if you think Earth would be where you are. Don't be shy, but okay. You don't have to. It's not a test or anything. You can just raise it anyway. <laughs> it turns out that our Earth, just for whatever strange reason, is about 200 sun diameters away. So if you can take this and just imagine putting 200 side by side. I don't know where that is. Maybe out on, not quite out on the street, maybe between here. At least when I came in, it was a really long walk to get here. You know, maybe like halfway out to the street. That's pretty far. So that's the size of Earth, the size of our sun. That's where that would be. Now, think about for a moment, where would our nearest star be? I'm not expecting you to answer this, but you know what the trick is in a talk like this? I always try to give you somewhere um, in this country that is as far away as possible. So I'll just guess for you, because <laughs> I didn't work it out for this, but let's say Alaska. So this sun, if that's the size of our sun, our sun is extremely big. The nearest star would be in Alaska, would be so far away. The distances between stars are just incredibly vast. And it's kind of we're out here in like the suburbs of our galaxy where things are all spread out. It's not great for us to go there. And so right now, our fastest spacecraft that is still going through space, the Voyager spacecraft, actually there's one faster, but let's take the Voyager spacecraft that were launched in the late 1970s. They're going about 20 kilometers per second. And it would take them tens of thousands, let's call it 70,000 years to reach the nearest star if they were even headed in that direction. So for now, can we go there? Not for now. <laughs> okay. So that sounds really funny, but I did want to bring this really important point up about exoplanets. Remember when I started my talk and I talked about the Greek philosophers and Bruno who was burned at the stake and this young woman whose memoir was literally scoffed at you know, by the native people about believing in planets elsewhere, where exoplanets is, what's so great about this field is that the line between what is completely crazy and what is mainstream is constantly shifting. And with the discovery of these other planets, including a planet around Proxima Centauri, our very nearest star to Earth, people have started to think about traveling to these worlds more seriously. I'm saying this with a straight face, but you know, you're totally welcome to, to laugh. <laughs> but, um, so in particular, there's this billionaire, Yuri Milner, who decided to put in $100 million to kind of renew the thought of how would we, not we, so it's not us, you know, we're not gonna send ourselves off in the spacecraft. Like, have you seen the movie Passengers? I just saw that on the plane, it's, yeah. We're not gonna do that right now. We're gonna send spacecraft. And they came up with a concept that had been around for a while. Um, it's gonna, and I'll describe that to you at the end of the talk if you're interested, but the point being that this line that's constantly shifting now, there's some serious money and serious interest in developing technology you know, behind the idea that it may be many generations before we figure out how to do this, although the people working on it want, us, want to launch something in 20 years from now or, or less. But just the fact that we know about these planets is inspiring uh, many more things. So if we can't go there, why look? And I would love to just spend hours and hours telling you about this because that's my main line of research. And it is actually so we can study planets from far away. And just all these movies, um, most of them in Star Trek and, and everything, get it all wrong because in those movies and TV shows, we have to go there to study the planet. And I always think like if they were to make a movie about an astronomer's regular life, it would be incredibly tedious. <laughs> you know, I go to my office and I work on my computer and I computer program and I try to fit models to data. And it's like a lot of just, you know, computer, a lot of work. Hard work, tedious, it just takes a long time. But we don't have to go there, we're not gonna have an adventure. Right now, we use space telescopes and large ground-based telescopes. This is an image of a Hubble Space Telescope, which is a workhorse uh, for so many fields in astronomy. And the Hubble Space Telescope is one we use. We have even better telescopes of the future. 
Here's a picture on the left of the James Webb Space Telescope. It's kind of like the next Hubble, but it's going to be way bigger, and it's going to work in the infrared, and it has a big tennis court-sized solar shield. And it's many layers, because as the sun heats up one layer, you don't want that layer to absorb and then reheat the next, reheat the telescope. It goes through all these layers, so the light will be, the heat will be dispersed in all directions. Here on this side, there's a giant telescope, the 30 meter telescope. And this telescope is supposed to go in Hawaii and be 30 meters, the mirror will be 30 meters in diameter. And we have many things of the future to study. But the way we're going, we study planets remotely, um, we look at their atmospheres. And I just have like a miniature tutorial on how we study exoplanet atmospheres. And I'm starting with this rainbow, because I'm assuming everyone has seen a rainbow. But what you might not know is that if you could look at the rainbow very closely, you would see that some colors are actually missing. And they're missing because of atoms and molecules absorbing radiation. Here's an image of our sun, not in a rainbow, not split up by raindrops, but instead um, by an instrument called a spectrograph. And look at all those lines missing. Some are smaller than others, some are really wide. And we've been using spectroscopy for many, many decades. It tells us information about molecules and atoms in stars and galaxies and everything all over through our universe. It's the main way we get information. And we also use this for exoplanets. And we do study exoplanet atmospheres now. We have data not on small rocky worlds that might host life, but on hot giant planets. We do see water vapor and we see gases like sodium. We see a whole bunch of things and we're just, this field is really starting to grow. Dozens of planets have their atmospheres measured. But it's still in the future for us though, that we like to get spectra of small planets. Because the transit technique that I focused on, um, if there is an alien civilization not too far from here, and they're looking back at our Earth transiting, they actually couldn't distinguish Earth and Venus. Earth and Venus are about the same mass and the same size. And so it turns out that we need way more information than we can get today. So we'd like to look at the atmospheres and we'd like to be able to see gases in the atmosphere. We want to see carbon dioxide. How much of a greenhouse problem does that other planet have? <laughs> you know? We want to know if there are gases like oxygen that's produced by life on Earth. Our atmosphere has 20% oxygen by volume. You know, we humans need to breathe. But without plants and photosynthetic bacteria, we would have no oxygen. So we're hoping that there are intelligent beings out there, I'm hoping that, looking back at us with the kind of sophisticated telescopes we're building now, and that they see oxygen and they're saying, wow, there has to be something up with that planet. Oxygen is so reactive that it really shouldn't be in our atmosphere at all unless it's being constantly replenished. So that's why we're looking. We're looking so we can study these planets remotely and see signs of life. And at this point, I should say one thing, because I always forget to say this, I'm so focused on my search for life, that if we look at a planet <coughs> far away and we see gases and we see some gases jumping out at us, like oxygen, that don't belong, that shouldn't be there, and we find a way to rule out all other possibilities and we might attribute it to life, that we won't know if it really is intelligent beings or if it's just like green slime covering the planet, giving off methane or other gases. So that's our search. Um, remote <clears throat> sensing to search for gases in a planet atmosphere that might be attributed to life. Okay, so we're gonna have um, time for questions, so I just have a few more things. I have a really complicated concept. I wasn't sure if I would have time to show it, so I'm just gonna breeze through it, okay? Because I didn't get to talk about my absolute favorite thing yet. Um, okay, so. Transits are only the first part of a long story because the planetary system has to be lined up just so, actually. It turns out planets could orbit like this, you know, um, in the plane, and you'd never see them transit. Furthermore, they're limited, really, to study atmospheres of these very small red dwarf stars. I think I might have showed my bias when I told you the Carrington event story. I personally am holding out for this um, true Earth twin, actually. It reminds me of, like, if you've ever gone on 23andMe, you may hope, like, wouldn't it be bizarre if you went on 23andMe and found out you had an identical twin? I went on 23andMe and I found I had a cousin, actually a first female cousin, who I didn't know. And I asked my two first female cousins if it was them, and it wasn't. They've never heard of 23andMe. And I just was so interested, I couldn't figure out who this was. And actually this Earth cousin versus Earth twin, it reminds me of like, imagine you had an identical twin out there. It'd be so exciting to meet that person. But now imagine you have a cousin, a different generation from a different country, uh, doesn't speak your language or anything. I mean, you don't even really have anything in common, just that you're cousins and 
Like, which would be more exciting? <laughs> I mean, okay, I ended up finding out who this cousin was because someone else joined 23andMe who also shared genes with that other person and honestly ended up being um, a much older person who's like from a different time and, and all that. It was my first cousin once removed. Kind of complicated. Well, I would really like to find the true Earth twin. I think it's in us from the Greek philosophers to Giordani Bruno to whomever that we want to know what's out there and we're really hoping um, to find something that we can identify with in some way. And so our search for the Earth twin, <laughs> I didn't mention this yet. Remember I was talking about one part in 100 or one part in 10,000 or 100,000 or one part in 10 billion. The true Earth twin, unfortunately, is the one part in 10 billion problem. Because our sun is so bright compared to Earth, it's the glare of the sun that's the problem. We imagine that we could somehow block out the starlight so we could see planets around it. And that's what we're trying to do, actually. Um, lots of people, but in particular, I'll tell you about one particular story. <laughs> Um, and it is actually called the Starshade. We imagine a giant screen all folded up. It launches with its telescope and these petals unfurl. And they actually um, have to be made very precisely to literally a few microns. And the petals have to unfurl and be displaced to within a few centimeters. This giant screen would be tens of meters across and it would have to formation fly tens of thousands of kilometers from its telescope. And the goal of the starshade, it's called a starshade, would be to block out the starlight so we could see planets directly. And during the Q&A, you can ask me about the shape or why it's so big and anything you want. There happened to conveniently in this animation be an Earth <laughs> and a Jupiter. But I wanted you to know that out in California at the Northrop Grumman Corporation and at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, people are taking this very seriously. Um, I get to lead the starshade, at least for now. And here is a picture of myself and two of my team members. Look how big that petal is. That's one of the petals. It's a special shape mathematically. And it looks dangerous. You don't want to get too near that tip. <laughs> the star shade is this incredible concept that was thought about in the 1960s by a person named Lyman Spitzer, who also came up with the Hubble Space Telescope concept. And every decade, it's been revisited. But it's so crazy and so out there um, that only today are we able to conceive of building it. And remember how I said the line between crazy and mainstream is constantly shifting? So that's partly why I tell you the story about going to the nearest stars. <laughs> so this, as crazy as it might sound, is actually within reach. Now the last question I'll get to is one that actually people do think a lot about. Why aren't they here? And there is this thought that people have. Um, this is just a joke, by the way, just so. <laughs> there is this thought that, you know, people have the Fermi paradox. It's this, you know, famous concept of, we're, we're doing so well, we think we're doing well. We've extracted, we know how to extract energy from our environment. We have energy, we can go places that, surely that if we survive for another thousand or 10,000 or 100,000 years, we'll figure out how to live on Mars and go to another star system and extract resources there and then eventually keep moving and colonizing the entire galaxy. And the concept is why isn't anyone here yet? And there are many reasons for that. Oh no, we don't know the reason for that now, but there are many thoughts why. You know, one is that, if we don't find life anywhere, some people think that's, that's um, if we don't find life, some people think there's a thing called the great filter where we're doomed, you know, nuclear war or climate change or something else that as we sort of get more and more um, overpopulated, we're gonna destroy our environment just like many other creatures do. So we don't know why they're not here. I just wanted to leave off with a more serious thought because here in exoplanets, we're trying to make strides towards answering those questions more directly. If we see planets and life everywhere, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to revisit those questions with more quantitative data. So I just would like to finish with a summary. And the summary were the questions that I get asked most often. What is an exoplanet? A planet that orbits a star other than the sun. Thousands are known. When and how will we find another Earth? We set aside the Earth's twin problem for now. And we'll be looking at small stars, uh, small planets around small stars in the next decade. Um, can we go there? Not for now. So why are we looking? We're doing remote sensing. We're using space telescopes and large ground-based telescopes on the ground for search uh, life by way of biosignature gases. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, great. So now I get to take a little break. I, I will now sit down and answer some questions. <laughs> so, um, and there's some microphones so that it will get recorded for the, uh, the archive. Professor, if um, we are building space telescopes, why bother building terrestrial telescopes because they have to look through the atmosphere? Wouldn't it be more cost effective 
to build more space telescopes. Yes, I definitely agree with you, but <laughs> we have a rule of thumb that anything in space costs 100 times more than on the ground. So if you're going to set out to fundraise for a million dollars to build something, in space that would be 100 million. Because just making sure it will all work and making sure that the high energy particles that hit it aren't going to destroy it, that just costs way more. So it's really just a matter of money right now. And the fact that you can do some things from the ground uh, makes sort of the funding agencies say, well, do what you can now because it's cheaper and we'll work towards the other thing later. I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson talk about the difference in DNA between great apes and humans of 1%. Could you comment on if there are cousins in out of space, if there's a 1% difference there, whether okay. we could even communicate with them? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, okay. That I can't answer, unfortunately, but I do think it may be impossible. I love the science fiction movies, by the way, like Arrival. Have you seen Arrival? I loved Arrival because the aliens that come here cannot communicate with us. It's almost impossible to, actually. So the answer to that one is we don't know. I would love to find out, but I think it's unlikely that they're anything like us. I mean, we see this huge diversity in exoplanets. Their masses and sizes and surface gravity and the amount of radiation they're getting from the star. I mean, they have to be different. They have to be evolving in a very different way. So personally, if I had to speculate, I would say I doubt it. I doubt they even have, I mean, I could say I doubt they even have DNA. I'm not a biologist, though. Would you comment on that story from earlier this year where there was uh, an exo or something that was causing massive amounts of dimming on one of our nearest stars? Sorry, I don't know the mm -hmm. yeah, I can technical tell you about name. That. And uh, one of your colleagues yes. postulated maybe it's an alien megastructure. Oh, why did he do that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... In astronomy, we do work really hard. Um, I was gonna say, we work super hard, so sometimes we just wanna have a little fun. That's kind of where it came from. But seriously, in the Kepler Space Telescope, like some of you work in other fields, like, I don't know, economics or healthcare, and we have this big data era, tons of data. And we use our computers and we look for stuff, we look by eye. And Kepler Space Telescope has revolutionized our field by taking so much data, and the data is all archived. You can look at the data yourself on a website called planethunters.org. And actually, it was just the crowdsourced public that was looking through the data and saw something crazy and alerted the team. And Tabitha, boy, yeah, I'm going to get her name wrong, I can't pronounce it. Let's just call it Tabby Star, wrote a paper about this object. Because remember how I showed you the transits, the regular drops? And they repeat once in orbit. It's very nice, like clockwork. This one does not do that. There are giant dips, followed by other little dips, followed by nothing, followed by more dips. Pause for a while, more dips. And actually, nobody has any idea what it is. I mean, the fact that today we can see something going on, we have no idea what it is. One of the best theories was it's a disrupted planet, like maybe two planets collided or an asteroid hit another asteroid, and there's debris. But if that happened, that would be really warm, actually, because these uh, energy from the sun which should hit the planet or the particles, and it should give off heat. Nobody sees anything else in the infrared. And so people work through all the explanations and don't really have one, actually. So another person decide to write a paper saying, oh, this could be alien megastructure. <laughs> and yeah, that one kind of got so much attention in the press, it just propagated through like wildfire. And now we're sort of stuck explaining it. So forget about the alien <laughs> megastructure. <laughs> so aside from the alien megastructure, it is a phenomenal star. We don't totally know what's going on. It's probably some cold cometary fragments that are going by, but we'll see. My question, I, I'm always amazed as far as what you've done and what scientists have done as far as exoplanets, you know, it's always amazing to see the, the graphics that come up. But my question is, why spend the money and the time on that when we, when we have planets in our own solar system that maybe we could use for future colonization or for minerals or things like that? Are we spending too much time on the exoplanet idea versus our own solar system? That's a really great question. I'm gonna think for a second how to answer it because like in science, I wish we had more money to do absolutely everything we wanted. And the sort of journey of exploration is really one that is just so broad actually. And we do hear arguments over and over again that we should study this and not that and study that and not that. Um, but I think when we want to understand in a broader sense, I'll just give you the motivation for why we're doing it. We just sort of want to really understand where did our Earth come from? You know, how did our solar system form and evolve? And the rest of these systems should give us more information for that. With regards to the search for life, you know, is anyone out there? 
we're pretty much convinced at least there's no intelligent life in our solar system. And so we're trying to do, like, I would say, um, quantity over quality by looking elsewhere. But I can't, I can't argue for one or the other because I wish we could do it all. Professor, this is a long-term collection of data. Can you speak to what specifically motivates you intrinsically to keep the effort up to search for life? Okay, I'll give you a really short answer to that. My short answer is I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, I just say that, like, that sort of sense of exploration that drives a lot of people or our human society at large, I, that's what drives me, actually. If I'd been born at another time, I might have been the explorer who went to the South Pole. I just want to know what's there. And much of our Earth has been explored. Uh, maybe parts of our, the bottom of the ocean floor hasn't. But just to know what's out there and explore space, that's primarily what, what drives me. And I just want to make one more point, that it is a generational search. You know, obviously I and my peers, we, we're the ones who are doing this first. We want to be the ones, you know, to do it, to find planets like Earth with life on them. But it may well be that we just find some hints of it, just enough to keep the search going and to motivate the funding to go to space, and that it's the next generation or the one after that or the one after that that actually really carries it to fruition. So you talk about um, the need to fast track um, the discovery of small stars, small planets, but how is that manifesting itself in the academic community? How are you collaborating with other astrophysicists to be able to do that? Well, let's see. It's a very competitive field, um, believe it or not, and I'd say there's less collaboration and more com competition, actually. And there's like a contention even between which small planets are better. So the Trappist ones I showed you, um, I love them, actually. It was a bit negative to them. But people will say, oh, those are horrible planets. They're never going to have life. All those cosmic energies, you know, those cosmic uh, high energy particles, just I wouldn't even bother. Now, those people have gotten up to give a talk and said, never bother with direct imaging from space and starshade. That'll be like forever from now. It's impossible. Why do it? That's what I do, though, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, the person who gave that actually apologized to me after. And I said, look, why are you, why are you seeing negative things? You know, the people in the, that particular audience were very young. I'm like, those people, they're going to be your age, and uh, that the search for the small star, planets around small stars will be hopefully matured, and they'll be doing that next thing. And then some of the other people are like, there's another type of star, small star, and then people say, no, I don't like those. Their surface gravity is so high. The atmosphere will be pulled very close to the surface. We won't be able to study the atmosphere. It will be so tightly bound. So people are just constantly fighting. I'd say there's more fighting um, than, than collaboration. In fact, there was a really great talk by E.O. Wilson, and he talked about groups competing with each other um, rather than individuals within a group. So I think that applies to us as well. Now, in terms of collaboration, there are some bigger things. At MIT, we're leading a mission called TESS, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It's for identical, essentially glorified telephoto lenses bolted to a plate. It's on a spacecraft about the size of two washing machines stacked on top of each other. It's built now. It is actually... Um, getting integrated in its spacecraft. It's going to launch, should la be launching in March of next year. And there we're collaborating because it's a very expensive project. And in order to even get our proposal to succeed, we had to pretty much bring everybody on board. <laughs> so there is collaboration and competition. And it's a lot like the ants and the other things in the previous talk. So uh, your research, your results, they increase probability of existence of aliens or is decreased? Great question. The question is, does my research or exoplanet research at large increase or decrease the probability of aliens? So right now, it's increasing because astronomers have found that small rocky planets are very common. You know, as many as one in five stars like our sun might have a planet that's the right temperature, although we don't know because we don't know the greenhouse gases, these rocky planets are very common. So right now, it increases. <coughs> but if we came back here in 20 years, and I or someone else gave you the update, we might say, look, we found no signs of life <laughs> whatsoever. And then we might say it decreases. So right now we're increasing and we're trying to maintain that optimism. Uh, hi. So um, is there any research going into like increasing the speed of our spacecrafts or any faster than light technology so that when we find these planets, we can actually go to them? OK, there's no research now about faster than the speed of light. However, I'll just briefly describe the um, the mission that I mentioned before. So the thought now is, you know how everything's getting smaller and better? Your phone, right? It's like a com it is a computer, basically. It's your phone and your camera and your video camera, and it's your, your everything. Well, everything's getting smaller and better, and the concept, that's the concept, 
is to send up lots, like thousands and thousands of little tiny spacecraft. Instead of called spaceship, call them space chips. And it'll be these tiny little things about this big. You'll put thousands of them up there. They will deploy a sail, and they will get accelerated to 20% the speed of light. And then they would take 20 years to get to the nearest star system. Now, this is extremely challenging for many reasons. But the concept is there now, and people are working to kind of work down each one. One of the challenging concepts is that to accelerate them, the idea is to use lasers. It's not just like one or two lasers shining on them and use photons, photon pressure on a big sail. You would need literally a square kilometer full of telescopes, each with a laser. It's the equivalent of like, I want to say 100 um, gigawatts. That's like having um, 100 billion light bulbs, the old light bulbs. Wait, if each one was 100 watts, 100 watt light bulb, you'd need a billion of those. Imagine having a billion light bulbs all in one place. But that's what the lasers would have to be, a square kilometer of telescopes with lasers, and they'd have to correct for atmospheric motions. And those would have to like turn on for like 10 minutes or so. Nothing could fly over because like airplanes would get vaporized. This is like serious stuff. And these little satellites would have, these little spaceships would have to get accelerated without being ablated, like without being, you know, but that's the idea. It's very hard to do, but yes, the answer is a resounding yes. People are thinking about this. And it's not speed of light, but clearly we all have to um, <laughs> live a very long time and, and see what happens. Because if 10 or 20 years from now, they can launch this and it will take 20 years. And these, there'll be thousands of them and hopefully some will survive the journey and they'll zoom past the planet, take pictures and send them back, which would take four years because it's four light years away. So that whole thing is somewhere um, on the horizon, but it's just fantastic that the research is happening. Hi, um, what is the overlap between your work and the work of SETI? Okay, overlap between mine and SETI. So SETI is a search for extraterrestrial intelligence by listening for radio signals. And in my work, it's more traditional astronomy by looking for planets and looking at the atmosphere for sign of life. They do overlap. Anytime new planets are found, SETI can turn their attention to those planets, actually, and listen in on them. So I just say they overlap in that discovery space. Why is the sun so big? OK, why is the sun so big? <laughs> why is the sun so big? OK, so in some ways, it's just a matter of chance that our sun is so big. Because clouds of gas and dust, eventually, they want to gravitationally collapse. And some of them, there's just a tiny fragment, and they end up not being a sun. That's one answer. Another answer is our sun is so big because it's like a giant furnace, and it's creating energy. And in order to create energy um, by fusion, <laughs> it just has to be really big. It has to be big enough so that the pressure and temperature in the center can create energy. So do people have to like man the, the Hubble Space Telescope? like constantly so it wouldn't smash into asteroids and stuff? Okay, good question. People do have to monitor Hubble constantly, actually. They do. So for, um, they're not worried about asteroids, per se, um, but it can't like look at the sun, it can't turn a certain way, and it has a really complicated program to be executed, so they have to send it to commands to tell it what to look at when. And if there ever were a giant flare coming here, they try to shut part of it down so it wouldn't get damaged. So yes, people have to constantly operate it. How do scientists know that it's gases that um, would show that there's life? Isn't that, doesn't that seem like it's basing it on what we know as life on our planet and maybe on another planet? Maybe people don't breathe or something. Yeah, maybe people don't breathe. It's possible. It is. Yeah, so we do have to make a giant assumption because we're really stuck with our, this sounds really lame, I know, but we're stuck with astronomers' tools, which are looking at light and looking at spectroscopy and looking for gases. And we're definitely making a basic assumption that life elsewhere uses chemistry like we do. Like we eat food and we breathe air and we breathe out air, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Uh, we use chemistry to extract energy and store it so that we can metabolize. We're making that assumption. It could be, yes, that life does other things like a windmill. Imagine if life is mechanical, it just uses cur air currents or water currents. It doesn't store energy, it somehow uses it right away. We can't find that life. And we acknowledge openly although I didn't say anything, I wasn't trying to hide anything, <laughs> didn't mention it. There could be all sorts of life out there. Imagine if there's a world with dolphins and no land life and no in dolphins we think are very intelligent, but they don't have hands, they're not gonna build radio telescopes and send us a message. Tons and tons of life like that will be impossible for us as astronomers to detect. But we're just hoping there's that it's a big place. You know, There's a lot of stars out there and we're just counting on the fact that there will be um, some planets with continents and with life and life like ours that uses chemistry. 
Have you read The Three-Body Problem by Sijin Liu? No, I haven't, actually. He postulates the answer to the Fermi paradox is the galaxy is actually full of life. And it's like a dark forest full of hunters. And anybody who peeps up gets shot. <laughs> what if the galaxy were like that? I mean, yeah, it could well be. Actually, the theory, the theory I like better, though, there's many, you know, angles to this. I love the theory that we're just dumb right now. Like, the, think about ants. Again, that was like E.O. Wilson, he said. Yeah. But imagine if there's all those ants out there and there, there's a big ant, um, you know, house or whatever they're called, the colony, ant colony in the big... Um, okay, I went to Norway once and in the forest, it's very much like our forest here, but they have giant ant hills like everywhere. They're so huge. Imagine there's an ant hill with an ant colony and we are building a super highway that's leading to an airport right beside their colony, but not damaging it. Like, do you think those ants would understand that? Like, we're building a super highway in an airport and we're going to fly. I mean, I feel like we're like those ants. And, you know, there's other things out there. Um, I don't totally believe this, but it's just my favorite answer to the Fermi paradox, that there is life out there, but we're just like the ants. How would we possibly even understand what they're doing? We're not even really worth communicating <coughs> with at this point. So I prefer that benign. Worldview. <laughs> As you fundraise for your projects, are there ever conflicts between what you'd like to do with the money versus what uh, people you're getting money from? And if you had no strings attached with the same budget, would, what would you do differently? Okay, that's a good question. Um, there usually aren't strings attached. Most of our money comes from NASA that is just trying to kind of further space exploration. Um, oftentimes, there's private funding as well. And they're usually, they usually won't fund you unless they're kind of in agreement of what you're going to do. I'd say our main limitation now is um, cooperation because um, the whole community in astronomy has to agree of how we spend our money. And to the point about do we study planets in our solar system or other ones or do we study gravitational waves or, you know, in black holes or what do we study? We can't usually agree because we all want to do our own thing. And so our biggest limitation actually is a way to all work together with and not all just hog everything. Now, if I could do it my way, I would actually know how to do it. First of all, I would build the starshade or something like it, and I would just handpick my team so that people knew how to work together, that they were loyal and hardworking, and they knew what they're doing. My most astonishing finding, actually, <laughs> so far, as I sort of move up the food chain in my world, uh, I think people share this in other fields, it's people. The main limitation is people, and the reason everything costs so much is people making mistakes or wanting to do this or wanting to do that or not getting along, yeah. And I just am so astonished to learn that it's that. So I would make sure that like some of the more successful things I've seen out there, you know, like if there's a startup that ends up succeeding big, the people are all usually, at least initially, you know, they're working together. They're a group that's cooperating and they have a leader and it, that works out and it all, it doesn't always last forever, but I'd make sure that I could just do it right from the start. Uh, if, a, if a telescope could be built on the moon and it was really sophisticated and they were looking for a team, would you go? I was looking for... A team, a team to, to man oh. that telescope on the moon. Actually, I wouldn't go to the moon myself. I don't like traveling that much, actually. Chicago. <laughs> um, like, Chicago's not that far from Boston. That's right, so I personally wouldn't go. But believe it or not, the moon is not ideal for this type of work. It's got, like, this regolith, this kind of dusty stuff, and it would just clutter it up. And we'd have to land there and assemble it. Really, space is the place to go. It's not only, you know, the final frontier, but it's above the atmosphere, and it's, it's the place to be. Well, thank you so much for your attention.